This morning we are wrapping up our series in James, talking about having this faith in action. Uh, And today we're really going to hone in on what it can look like to have a a powerful prayer life in um, our lives. Before we do, though, I just want to ask you this question. Have you ever felt powerless in the face of life's challenges? So kind of a deep question to ask this morning. Have you ever maybe felt powerless in uh, the face of life's challenges? Maybe you've searched for strength. You've tried to search for answers, but you kind of find yourself stuck and and maybe locked outside of what God uh, is calling you to do. Maybe more literally in your life, um, you have been uh, locked out of a building or or a door and you've got this whole big jumble thing of keys, right? Anybody ever been there before and you don't know what key goes to what? I've, I've found myself here in this lovely, wonderful building asking myself often, what key goes to where in some of this, right? I've, I've found myself in that situation before uh, trying it out, and one key doesn't even fit, and another key will fit, but it doesn't turn. Like, that doesn't make sense, right? How does a key fit in the hole, but it doesn't, doesn't turn? Maybe there's, there's color-coded keys, and so it's like the red key, clearly that means it's an important key, so that should fit for the door, but it ends up not doing it, and I'm just spinning my wheel trying to find uh, the different keys uh, to fit for a lock, and, and maybe you found yourself uh, in that situation in your life as well. You just keep trying over and over again to to make a key work, to open a door, to unlock a a feeling of being stuck in your lives. And I think the moment of feeling stuck or of locked out, we're trying to access what it is that God wants us to do. So often I I think we ask ourselves like, God, what is your will for my life? What is your plan for my life? What do you wanna do with this situation? God, I I feel stuck and I want to break through this. I wanna open this door that that is causing me to feel stuck uh, in life. And uh, when we really need him is what we need his power to come through in our lives. But what if I told you the power that we seek, the opening of that door, if you will, the master key, if you will, is right, at our temple, is, is right at our fingertips through the simple yet profound art of prayer. We're going to dive into to what prayer actually can look like in our lives in these moments of, of feeling stuck, in these moments of asking ourselves and asking God, what do you want to do with this situation? You see, I believe that prayer is that key that unlocks God's power. We're going to talk about that today. In four different ways, I think it offers us comfort, it offers us restoration, it offers us fellowship, and lastly, we're going to talk about how it offers us power in our prayer lives as well. If you've been around with us for some time uh, as a church family, you'll know we say this often, but we say that prayer isn't just part of the work, but prayer is the work. In all that we do, in all of our lives, prayer is the work that God uses in us and through us. And it's not just, let me do all these things, let me try to do all the right things, let me uh, try to go with what I think is right, and then I'll just pray a quick blessing over it. No, 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 we need to pray fervently throughout all of the work of our lives. Prayer is not just a part of the work, but prayer is the work in all of our lives. And so today we're going to be in uh, James 5, as we said Uh, earlier, concluding our series in James uh, this week. Uh, James 5, beginning in verse 13, uh, really points at these four key components that I think our prayer lives can can really transform all aspects of our lives as well. I'd love for you to turn uh, with me there in your Bibles today if you uh, brought them with you. Uh, we'll also have it up on the screen. You can also scan that QR code uh, and fill, uh, fill out uh, the form to, to check out a uh, Connect card like Pastor Dan mentioned. We'd love to connect with you. That'll also pull up our scripture for uh, today. Uh, you can do that. Uh, lastly, if you don't want to do any of that, there's physical copies of uh, uh, Bibles in front of you in those chairs there. Uh, Take one of those out and turn to James 5 with me there as well. If you do not own a Bible, uh, those Bibles are yours. We want everybody that comes through these doors to own a copy of God's Word. And so we'd love for you to turn with me to James 5 in whatever way you want to do that today. Um, A little bit of context as you are turning there. Uh, As you uh, recall, if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, James is the half-brother of Jesus, meaning like there's probably still some sibling rivalries that happen there, right? And uh, he doesn't even acknowledge that Jesus is Lord until he sees him resurrected. So like I can, I can understand that being the youngest of, of three, uh, having two older brothers. Like if my brother for uh, all of our lives said that he was the son of God, that'd be hard for me to kind of hear. You talk about a sibling rivalry and sibling, je- sibling jealousy, like, that's crazy, right? And then finally, if he re- uh, came back resurrected, I'd be like, all right, bro, I get it. You're, 
you are Lord, you're the Son of God, right? But I love that, that Jesus still chooses to use James. Um, and we've been walking through this beautiful picture in uh, his letter the past few weeks of how to really activate our faith, how to have this faith in action. And this activation really does start with prayer and all that we do. Uh, we might be talking about prayer last in our series in week five, but really if you look back on all the weeks that we've been talking about, prayer has to be the factor in all of those things. And so we figured we'd save the best for last in talking about prayer and how it can activate us to have a faith in action. And so read with me in James 5 beginning in verse 13. I'm gonna read all the way through to 18 and then we'll talk about what these verses mean for us in our lives today. It says this in verse 13. It says, is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Verse 17, Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. Let's pray over these verses and then we'll talk about them today. Father, you are good. We thank you that we are able to come and worship you this morning. Lord, what a reminder and just beauty uh, that it is that we can come together as a body of believers and worship uh, the living, true God today. And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us uh, for the rest of this morning. Lord, let these verses come to life for us in a fresh in a real way, Lord, as we talk about how they can transform our prayer life, God, and how that can go on to transform our lives as well. So we thank you, Father. Speak to us now in the only way that you can. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So James 5, there's, there's four real questions I want to ask us in regards to our prayer life and how we can really activate our faith through that. And the first one is this. Do you seek comfort in your prayers? What do I mean by that? Do you seek comfort in your prayers? Verse 13 says, is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Uh, I think this idea of comfort often gets misconstrued uh, in our world. We like to sometimes think of warm, cozy feelings, right, when we think of this, this word comfort. Uh, who all absolutely loved the weather this weekend? Anybody? Like, come on, let's go, right? Uh, I was talking with, with Caleb, our student director, a couple days ago, talking about just like, this just, there's something that happens when that first crisp air hits, and it's like, I immediately want football, right? Uh, there may or may not be a game that kicks off in two minutes. And so I'm aware, so uh, tell the guy that's teaching today to be quick. I know there's, there's a football game happening today, right? Like fall is in the air, even though like we all know if we've been in Colorado for any time, that's just a false front. Like we're gonna have scorching hot heat for the next four weeks really. So uh, that was a little bit of false hope, but like we want that, right? There's something about the fall, uh, getting, uh, getting maybe a pumpkin spice latte and getting a blanket and hitting the couch. You wake up and it's like college game day is going and I'm, I'm comfortable in those settings, right? Uh, that's sometimes what we think about uh, when we think about this idea of comfort, but that's not really what actually God promises us when he tells us he will comfort us. Comfort means that we can rest in the Lord in all circumstances. It means that if we are on cloud nine or if we are in the pits of despair, we can still praise him like what James is telling us. And the peace of God surpasses all of our understanding, and he promises us that he will be with us. And this is what verse 13 says. If anyone among you is suffering, he should pray. If anyone is cheerful, he should sing praises. What this means is that our prayers need to be continual and ongoing despite the things that are happening in our lives, whether good or bad. We need to continually give praise to God, looking for his comfort, looking for his rest, looking for his peace. I think back to what Paul tells us in Philippians. Uh, and this is a, a verse that, quite frankly, just gets misconstrued a lot as well. If you've read the Bible or been familiar with it at all, you'll probably uh, know it. It's a verse that we put on coffee mugs. It's a verse that we put on shirts. It's, it's a, sh uh, a verse that we put on uh, the doors. We walk out and we smack the door and we're like, let's go, let's go have a good day, right? It's Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What a, what a great verse. Uh, we like to believe that that means that we can do anything and everything and then just stamp a little blessing on it and pray over it and God's gonna allow that to happen. 
Not the case. Uh, anybody watch that Olympic gold basketball game yesterday? Come on. I mean, let's go. Steph Curry, y'all. LeBron James. Come on, Kevin Durant. That's like my childhood all on one. It was, it was beautiful. I may or may not have cried. Just kidding. I didn't cry. Don't judge me if I did, though. Uh, that was amazing to watch, right? Um, I want to dunk like LeBron James desperately. I've been wanting to dunk like LeBron James since 2003 when he entered the league and I was seven years old. Uh, here's the deal. God hasn't quite answered that prayer yet for me. And unless I, I have a growth spurt to become six foot eight overnight and 250 pounds, uh, I probably don't think that I'm going to go and just recite that verse and then be able to go dunk a, a basketball. Yet we've taken that verse out of context. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, yes. But looking at what Paul says before that, he's talking about how he knows how to live in abundance. He knows how to live in chains and in slavery and in poverty. And he says in any circumstance, he's learned how to be content. He's learned how to be comforted, and that's why he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. He knows how to pray in the valley. He knows how to pray in the mountaintop. If anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. If anyone among you is cheerful, then sing praises. That's what God's comfort does for us. And so do you seek comfort in your prayers? Do you seek the peace of God in your prayers? Not the situations to be more comfortable for you, but do you seek God's comfort in your prayers? Because God is the ultimate source of comfort in our lives. And we can go through all things, like Philippians tells us, when we remember that we are on his side. A, a religious writer by the name of Hannah Moore in the 1700s put it this way. She says, the uh, affliction is the school in which great virtues are acquired and in which great characters are formed. Uh, nobody wants to go through affliction in this world. Nobody wants to go through trials. If you do, then like, come talk to me. I just got to pick your brain on some stuff. None of us want that, right? We want that cozy blanket feeling, that pumpkin spice latte feeling. But those things are feelings, and our feelings are fleeting. The Bible tells us that they come and go like the waves that crash over us. And God offers us much more than a cozy comfort feeling. He offers us virtue. He offers us character. He offers us the ability to continue to be molded in the image of him and become the person that he's calling us to be. And so are we seeking comfort from him in our prayer lives? Second question this morning is this. Do you seek restoration in your prayers? Do you seek restoration in prayer? Verse 14 and 15 say this, is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Um, there's a lot of debate about what James is specifically talking about here when it comes to healing. And what I, I don't want you to hear today is that if you just pray over a physical healing or a physical circumstance, like it's automatically going to get healed. I, I wish that were the case. I really do. And I want you to hear this today as well. Prayer is maybe sometimes something that doesn't necessarily change our circumstances. It might not. But what it does time and time and time again is change our hearts. It might not change the physical circumstance that we are in, but I promise you, if you continue to pray and seeking comfort and now seeking restoration, it's going to change your heart. God is a miracle worker. He's a healer. He's a mover of mountains. He does physical miracles day in and day out, all day, every day. He does those things, and it's crazy, and it's awesome, and we get to worship him for that. But I, I'm scared if we only call him those things based on the circumstances of our life and what, he, uh, what we want him to do for us, and we're saying he's only worthy if he comes through in this way and exactly how I want it, I'm scared that we're not actually giving him the praise that he deserves of being who he is, regardless of the box that we might try to put around him. And what James is, is talking about here, he's mentioning key, uh, healing is, is key in verse 15. He says, the prayer of faith will save the sick, and then what? They will be forgiven who have sinned. And, and so James is concerned with physical healing, as is God. But physical sickness stems from a fallen and broken world that we live in. 
because of the fall of Adam and the fall of humanity and sin that has entered the world, we have to go through physical hardships. We have to go through physical circumstance, physical sicknesses in this life. And you and I actually, in turn, what James is saying here, we all have a sickness in each and every one of us, and that is known as sin. And this verse is alluding to this spiritual weakness. It's alluding to this spiritual weariness, spiritual exhaustion, and spiritual depression. And he talks about we have to deal with all the suffering of sin that accompanies it, and we have to seek it out in prayer. We have to seek restoration through those things. And, And listen, I know there is real hurt when it comes to physical healing and physical circumstances that don't get answered by God. Like, I know there's, there's hurt in that. But we also desperately need to be praying for our spiritual healing as well. And that's called restoration. God wants to help you in your physical afflictions, but he also wants to chase after you and restore your soul back to his Restoration is this process of God putting the broken pieces of our souls back together. And by the way, that's a lifelong process. Until we are fully with Jesus face to face, we got to ask for God to restore us, to continue to mold our souls and our hearts back uh, to him until one day we're going to be in a place with no physical uh, afflictions. We're going to be in a place with no sickness. We're going to be in a place with no physical circumstances that are around us that are daunting and challenging us each and every day. But until then, we've got to pray for that spiritual restoration of our souls. And you and I are on this journey on earth to try to look more and more like Jesus every day. And if you're anything like me, there's certain days that go by where you just tell yourself, God, like, I'm sorry. I didn't really look like you today. Like, I should have looked like you. God, will you piece my soul back together in the way that only you can? Would your love, would your affection, would your mercy for others bleed through into my life as well and help me restore my soul um, back to you despite the fact that I might fall and not look like you today? I'm believing that you can restore my soul back to you. We must cling to praying for restoration until the day that we finally get to see Jesus face to face. And what I also don't want you to hear today is that physical sickness is a result of sin, a direct result of sin. That's not actually what the Bible teaches us. I was in a commentary reading uh, a little bit uh, last evening, and it says this. It says, the Bible nowhere teaches that all sickness is a direct result of an individual's sins. Spiritual defeat, however, is often both the cause and result of sin. When that is the case, the antidote is to confess those sins to God and obtain his forgiveness and ask for restoration. Remember what Philippians says. You can do all things and endure the physical hardships of this life, but you have to rely on Jesus' restoring power, and we have to desperately pray for that. And so do you ask for comfort in your prayers? Do you ask for restoration in your prayers? Third question this morning is this. Do you seek fellowship in prayer? Do you seek fellowship in prayer? Verse 16. Therefore, Confess your sins to one another. Everybody just say one another. And pray for one another. Say it again. Says it twice in one verse. That means it's probably important, right? Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that what? You may be healed. And this is where the rubber meets the road in our prayer lives, I think. Because often when we talk about our prayer life, it's fun to praise God. It's fun to worship him and say, God, you're doing a great work. Will you do, continue to do a work? It's fun to ask things of God. We really got that one down as far as praying to God. We really got the request piece down. But this is one that I think we kind of struggle with sometimes. And this is the one that really where the rubber meets the road happens in our life. And that is confessing to one another and to God. If you want to exponentially see a difference in your prayer life and how God is moving through your prayers, you'll seek it right here in fellowship, in community, in confessions with one another, in building up one another, and holding each other accountable. Healing comes through confession together. In fellowship, it comes with confession to God as well, where we need help and where we need his restoring power. And understand this, sin is its most powerful in isolation. The enemy wants you to be isolated. He wants you to hold these things in that you're not meant to hold in and don't let it grow stronger and stronger and stronger. Healing, true healing is found in confession both to God and to one another. 
I was just thinking about this uh, last night and uh, stories that I've had of just holding in thoughts about one of my uh, best friends growing up. We, we both kind of didn't see eye to eye in a certain situation, and we let some of those things fester. And there were things that I was holding in that, that I uh, didn't like that he did. And there were probably things that I was holding into that I'm like, man, I, I should have handled that in a better situation. And finally, after a couple of weeks that went by, we actually brought that to one another. And he said, you know, man, I, I've been thinking the same thing of like, here's where I, I think we didn't see eye to eye on, but here's where I messed up as well. And I told him the areas and and I might have hurt him and messed up as well. And we were able to come together and actually heal together and become stronger in our friendship. God doesn't want you to confess so that everybody knows your dirty laundry. He doesn't want you to confess so that everybody has something to hold something over you. By the way, if that's what happens when you confess to people, I want to tell you right now, get a different community. That is not why we should confess for people to hold things over us, but God wants you to confess so that what James says, you may be healed, so that the burden that you were never meant to carry in the first place can be lifted from you. That's the beauty of confession. That's the beauty of walking and praying corporately together. It's the beauty of praying for one another and helping one another and keeping each other accountable so that that burden that you were never meant to carry in the first place can be lifted so that you can be reminded that, as Ecclesiastes tells us, a cord of three strings is, uh, that's wound together is not easily broken. We're stronger when we're together. We're stronger when we're walking in fellowship. And so we must seek prayer in that. Do you seek fellowship in your prayer? Last question this morning. Do you seek power in prayer? Do you seek power in prayer? Here's the good news. There is power in every single one of our prayers, which is crazy to think. Whether we believe it or not, there's a power in our prayers. Not because of who we are or of the great things that we say or the, the trying to say the right words at the right times to really hit a chord with other people that might hear our prayers. None of those reasons are why our prayers are powerful, but it's because of who we're praying to is why our prayers are powerful. James says this at the latter half of of verse 16. He says, the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Verse 17, Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. Uh, If you're unfamiliar with the Old Testament or who Elijah is, Elijah is a prophet uh, in the Old Testament. That's someone who was a leader in Israel, and he was showing them many, many, many ways of how uh, they were doing things that were going against God, and he gave them all these avenues to turn um, back to God. And I think immediately we just look at people like Elijah. We look at other prophets in the Old Testament. We look at the the Abrahams of the world, the Noahs of the world, the, the Moseses of the world, and we think like, well, I can never really be like them. I mean, the voice of God was literally telling them what to do, right? How can I match up with that? God's not necessarily maybe doing that in my life, but James tells us here, Elijah was just like you and me. Actually, in fact, if you look into some of his story, he was somebody who was uh, oftentimes hungry and and didn't have a lot of food to eat sometimes. He was even depressed. Uh, There was many times where he was afraid, and he told God, God, I'm afraid of what this might be, and God had to direct him and tell him to go through with the things that he was telling him to go through with. But he prayed with power, and he prayed with the power of God on his side, and he was able to do that because he was righteous. James says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful. Righteousness in the dictionary can be defined as this, morally right or justifiable. Uh, In terms of someone even being righteous in God's eyes, uh, you could think of it something like this. Someone who has discerned God's will already because they're that in tune with him. That's what righteousness means. They're abiding in the spirit of God. They know the steps that God is wanting them to take because they are so in tune with him. And our righteousness does not come from our own self. And so our power, when we talk about the power in our prayer lives, does not come from our own self uh, either. But what does Jesus tell us? He says, you will receive what when the Holy Spirit comes? Power, right? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes Upon you, and you will be my witnesses to all of the world. And so, a question today is is do we believe Jesus when he says that? Like, if he tells us that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit is in us, do we actually believe him? Listen, you are not saved to be powerless, 
But you have the living and active God living inside of you if you have said yes to following Jesus. And it is nothing that you can do on your own, but it's his power that lives inside of you. And so your prayer lives, our prayer lives should reflect that. To say like, God, I I don't know what lies outside of those doors today. Maybe you wake up and you have no idea what's about to happen in your life that day. Maybe work's gonna be crazy or family life's gonna be crazy or there's things that you just gotta tackle that you don't think you can tackle. Maybe you're stuck. And a a prayer that I, I want you to pray this week is just to say, God, I don't know what is outside of those doors, but here's the deal. I trust in you as the one who leads and guides and directs my steps. And that nothing catches you off guard or surprises you. And everything Everything that happens today is for my good and for your glory. Like, let's pray with power. I'm telling you, if you begin to pray with power that the Holy Spirit gives you, then you'll start to experience this life in the fullness that Jesus tells us that we can experience it. But that doesn't mean it's going to get easier. Jesus tells us, in this life, you will have troubles but take heart for I have overcome the troubles of the world. It's, it's not gonna get easier necessarily. But I tell you what, I would much rather walk through the tri- trials and pain and hardships of this life with the God of the universe than without him. And there's a power that we can walk with in that. And so how do we do this? How do we realistically pray with comfort? How do we pray with restoration? Those things sound great. How do I actually pray with fellowship? How do I pray with power when I feel so powerless? How do we do some of these things? As the band comes back up this morning, I just wanna give you three simple ways to try to do that this week. Three simple ways in which we can pray in some of these four aspects. If you are a note taker today, you're gonna be pleased because all these things start with an S, so you're welcome for that. Uh, Even if you're not a note taker, I encourage you to write this down and remember this this week. If you wanna have a meaningful and a life-transforming prayer life, I think the first thing you need to do is this, is simply to schedule it. Schedule it. Set aside a, a dedicated time each day for prayer. Just like any important activity, I think prayer needs to be prioritized. It needs to be planned for a specific time uh, each day, whether it's morning, noon, or night. Spend time in prayer. Commit yourself to to schedule it out and say, this time of day, I'm going to pray. Set an alarm in your phone. Maybe it's one of your favorite Bible verses. One of mine is Luke 10, 2. So at 10, 02, I have an alarm that goes off, and it's a pray to the, uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest that they would come. And so at 10, 02, each day, I pray for that for our city because we desperately need more harvest workers. Maybe it's Philippians 4.13. Put in your alarm at 4.13 on on every single day. Just pray that God would give you the strength to do all things through him. I don't know what it is, but schedule it out in your prayer life. Schedule your prayer time. It's the most important thing you can do. We schedule out every single other thing in our lives, so why not schedule it out, be intentional with our prayer time, and dedicate a time to pray each and every day. We have a Tuesday morning prayer gathering that we meet at 7 a.m. every single Tuesday. I want to invite you and encourage you, come. We meet right here in the, in the Riverside Chapel and just come together for an hour every single Tuesday and, and pray together. That's a scheduled out time that we wanna dedicate to the Lord to say, God, we don't know what today is gonna bring, but we're gonna choose at 7 a.m. on Tuesday mornings to pray to you, expecting you to move. Schedule out your prayer time. Second thing is this, share it. Schedule it and and share it. Share your your prayer requests with others. Engage in this community of prayer by sharing your needs and praying for one another. Find a a prayer partner, whether in this room or somebody that you know, a trusted friend where you can sit and and share and pray for each other regularly and walk through things together so that what? So that you may be healed. Don't we wanna be healed, church? Then share our prayer life together. Share with each other what you're going through. Find a prayer group. Again, Tuesday mornings, 7 a.m., right here. There's a group of people that wanna share in prayer together with you and walk alongside of you. And we see the power of communal prayer in that. So schedule it, seek it. Lastly, you need to do this. You need to seek it. Schedule it, share it, and seek it, last but not least. Seek God's presence and power intentionally in all your circumstances. 
Be mindful of God's presence throughout the day and turn to him both in the good times and the bad. Because prayer is a two-way communication between you and God. We like to think that we just want to immediately go into it and pray and ask all these things and then just hang up on God. But I want to encourage you this week, seek out the presence of the Lord. Slow down. Seek his presence. Ask him, God, what do you want to show me? One of my favorite verses in all of the Bible is Jeremiah 29, 13. It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Praise the Lord that he chases after us with his whole heart. And so we need to seek after him wholeheartedly in the same way that he runs and chases after us wholeheartedly. And so look for moments throughout your day. Connect with God, whether that's in in gratitude, just saying, God, thank you for this moment right now. I don't deserve this. Maybe it's a need. God, I just need you to show up right here, right now. It doesn't have to be long prayers, but seek his presence in everything throughout your day. Seek him with your whole heart. And that verse promises us that we'll find him if we do that. Maybe you're in the room today and you've never actually walked through with this in having a personal relationship with Jesus. And maybe you've been trying to open the lock with all of the keys that are jumbled up in your life that you think are gonna lead to happiness, whether it's jobs or family or social status or money. I don't know what it is. And all of those things have not worked. That door is still locked. You can't walk through it. Can I tell you something? There's only one person who can give you what you're searching for. And he's got the master key. And his name is Jesus Christ. And no matter what locks you have on a door, no matter what chains are holding you back that you can't unlock, it doesn't matter because he has the master key and he can unlock happiness and freedom and forgiveness. I don't care if they are locks of addiction or pride or lust or insecurity or anxiety or doubts or fears or feeling that you are not enough. Jesus can unlock all of those chains for you in your life. He wants to comfort you. He wants to restore you. He wants to give you fellowship and community. He wants you to have power when you pray to him. The question is, will you let him unlock the chains that you have on your life right now? If you have never said yes to following Jesus, it's the best decision you can make. I promise you that. He wants to unlock freedom for you and forgiveness for you and hope for you. And if you haven't said yes, or if you have said yes to follow Jesus, if you're a believer in the room today, but maybe life's just been really hard, and you've maybe forgotten of some of those chains that Jesus freed you of, maybe you go back to them. Maybe life has just caused you to go back to some of those chains. Man, I pray that you feel and experience the power of his presence like you never have before. To remember that he has never left your side and that he is victorious. And we get to be on his side forever. Be encouraged of that today. That you'll commit your life to a desperate prayer in him in every single avenue of your life. To say, God, I I don't care what this life or this enemy throws at me. I don't care what comes my way or what hardships come my way. Just as Paul says, I'm convinced that neither life nor death nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers of height or anything created can separate me from the love of my perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. Remind yourself of that truth today. If you've said yes to following him, nothing in this world will separate you from his love. May we be reminded of that day in and day out until one day we're finally made whole. And Jesus calls us to be with him and we get to see him face to face and worship him forever. And until then, may we today be a people that commit to prayer. May we be a church that commits to prayer. Prayer isn't just part of the work, but prayer is the work in all that we do. We've got to be committed to that church. And so today, we want to practice that. We want to commit to being a people of prayer right now today. 
I want to ask our, our deacons and elders and any uh, pastoral staff in the room today just to come down to uh, the front here. We're going to take a few moments just to pray together. And if you need prayer in your life right now, if you need healing, if you need comfort, if you need restoration, if you need confession, if you need just to talk to somebody and pray with them, take a moment to come down. We would love to pray for you. Use this altar right here. You can pray at your seats as well. I want to encourage you. Find somebody around you. Let's, let's pray together. A cord of three strands together is not easily broken. There's power in praying together. And so we're going to take a moment at your seats or coming down whenever you are ready. We're going to pray through four avenues that we've talked to today. But I just want to read James 5, verse 13 again. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over them, anointing them with the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. So let's take a moment. Without your seats together in those seats or coming down here, let's first pray for comfort. Pray for comfort. Pray for God's peace in your life right now. A peace that surpasses understanding. Take a moment and pray for that. Next, maybe your soul right now just feels like it's in a million different pieces. We can pray with restoration that God would restore our souls back to him. Take a moment there at your seats or together to pray for God to restore your soul in the only way that he can. So put the pieces of your heart and your soul back together. Cry out to him, pray for that for him today. Next, how about fellowship? Pray that God would continue to grow you and your community right here. Pray for next steps, that God would give you the next step to take in walking together with your brothers and sisters in this room today, with our church family, with people that you wanna walk alongside with. Pray that God would give you that fellowship, that community. Pray and confess the things that you need to confess to him, that he would heal you. The one who seeks confession will be healed, as James tells us. Pray that God would encourage you to continue to seek community. You could find that here in the church family that loves you. Take a moment and pray for that. Finally, this is the fun one. Let's pray for the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of each of us. 
If you have said yes to following Jesus, you have that power within you. So pray that his power would go before you, beside you, and all around you today. That no matter what you face, your God is powerful and he's greater than those things. Remind yourself, ask God to remind you of the power of his presence that lives within inside of you. Pray for his power as we close. God, we come to you not wondering if you're going to move, but expecting you to move in each of our lives. Because you alone, Lord, are worthy to be praised today. You stepped into our mess. You stepped into our world. You stepped into our sin and our brokenness, and you told us there's another way. There's a better way. And that way is trusting in the personal work of Jesus Christ. And so we commit to you today, God, to be a church that prays, to be a people that prays, to say, God, if you don't move, then we don't wanna move either. Lord, we don't wanna do anything apart from your will and your grace and your mercy on our lives. And so we pray desperately, God, that you would use us in a way that only you can. Lord, I pray right now for any brothers and sisters in the room that need healing, that need comfort, that need restoration, Lord, that need power, that need to walk in fellowship together, Lord, that you would give that to them, that they would see that they are not alone. There's a church family here that loves them and is for them, but even greater than that, there's a perfect God who will never let them down, who has a plan for everything in this life and the next, and they can hope and trust in that, God. Oh, Lord, let us be a church that prays because we believe that prayer is the work in all that we do. Thank you for your power and your spirit, Jesus. Let us trust in you today in all our days. No matter what comes our way, Lord, we know that you are in control and that you're greater than those things. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for caring enough to save us for even caring enough to listen to our prayers. What a beauty and honor that is to get to talk to you day in and day out. May we never take that for granted, Jesus. And so would you give us power in our prayer lives this week, Lord? May we take a step to commit, to schedule it, Lord. Lord, to, to search it and to seek it in all that we do and to share it with others. We pray these things, we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus.